I'm Oliver Payton. This is Eating Art, the series that takes food from the artist's palate to the plate. As a restaurateur and art collector, in this series, I'm combining my two great passions. My fascination for food. That is beyond fantastic. And my addiction to art. The beauty of this painting, the intensity of it, it's a masterpiece. For centuries, only paintings gave us a taste of what and how we used to eat. Everybody is off their heads here. So in this series, I'm traveling across Europe and North America on a journey to discover the history and the stories behind food on canvas. It's just amazing. Very amazing. It must have been the punk of his time. Visiting the homes of the world's most prolific food artists and discovering how food was eaten at the time. There's a far more intense flavor than I was expecting. Good to see you. Plus, I'll be dropping in on the world's most acclaimed chefs who bring these great gastronomic artworks to life. This is an artist at work. Creating their own masterpiece on a plate. I love bread. I love bread so much that instead of buying in bread for our restaurants, I make it in our own bakery. I'm obsessed. It's a source of national pride. Rich people eat bread, poor people eat bread. It is our daily bread. It's no wonder then that artists have chosen to depict it throughout the ages. Bread has always been fundamental to the way we live. Yet in art, it symbolizes so much more. Politics, class and religion. Even the very nature of its texture and shape has fascinated artists for centuries. At my restaurant in London, I want to take a closer look at one of the oldest artistic representations of bread. This first century fresco, discovered on the walls in a house in Pompeii, shows a very early bakery. I hate to use the phrase that every cloud has a silver lining. But what Pompeii has given us here is just an extraordinary time capsule of a bread maker in the first century. And as a person who makes and sells bread, I feel quite emotional looking at this because, you know, little has changed. And in some ways, that really warms my heart because we are still doing the same thing in almost the same way as they were doing in Pompeii. I mean, how beautiful is that? I love the shapes. The shapes are quite developed shapes. Already in the first century, you've got sort of developed bread culture in terms of sizes and style, obviously to suit different people's needs. To find out how powerful an influence Roman cuisine was in Europe, I've come to the Museum of London to meet food historian Kate Cahoon. So the Romans spread an awful lot of things to Britain, didn't they? Well, they sucked in all that was new and exotic and special from all the corners of their empire, which was so wide that it went from, you know, the Rhine to Libya and so on. And Britain was right on the edge of that, but it still sucked into it new ingredients, new techniques and kitchens like this one, which was such a far cry from what had gone before. You know, a Roman kitchen like this shows the place of food in Roman and Roman British society was really extraordinarily important. It was an expression of power as much as anything else. And if the Romans left anything, they didn't just change the way that the countries they colonized looked and felt, they actually changed the ways that they smelt and tasted. Are there any bread recipes from Roman times? There are endless kind of recipes for, especially poppy seed and caraway. They ate um, oysters in bread, they, used, they put cheese in bread, M more kinds of bread than, than we could really poke a stick at. And we think we eat lots of different sorts of bread now. I think we're a very bread-heavy society. To see some Roman baking in action, I'm wrapping up to visit the only work in Roman kitchen in Britain, Butzer Ancient Farm in West Sussex. Culinary historian Sally Granger has her very own replica of a Roman bread oven, and she's going to bake me a loaf Caesar would be proud of. This is what you'd see in a Roman house in, in Italy, particularly in Pompeii. They survive in virtually all the houses. Um, and it, if you think about it, it's simply a half, but at a nice, convenient height, so you don't have to bend over anymore. The fresco, I'm so intrigued by it. It's glorious, isn't because it? Because the whole concept of how modern, you know, they were at that time is just... I mean, I'm, it's, I'm it, amazed by it. It's getting every loaf of bread 
to look the same. And that is difficult. It's almost on an industrial scale. And you can imagine rows of slaves moulding and kneading this bread. But enough chat. Sally's getting down to business. This is basically flour and water and the wild yeast that's in the air. And it's been warming up on the fire. Now, we're going to mix it with some flour. What we have in here is a mixture of white flour and spelt flour to try and duplicate what was found um, in ancient bread. So they actually had particular vessels for...? Uh, for kneading bread, yes, yeah. But now we're going to get a little gooey for a while. So I'm, I'm forming my two layers of bread, which I think is what's happening with this image. You get a sense in which it's like a very flat cottage loaf. Two layers. Mm. Why are you cutting it up like that? This is, this is how you get those marks that you find here. Obviously made with a knife. So you're going to let, the, you're going to let it prove yes. now? Is this what would have happened in Pompeii? I think so, yes, yes. You actually find proving rooms in the, in the big bakeries where it was obviously left to prove. Um, you need to get it to warm up so that the yeast starts to become active. Right. Whilst we wait, I get a chance to look around this extraordinary ancient farm which recreates so much history. By the time I get back, the bread has risen. Our oven's been heating up for about two hours and it is so hot I don't want to touch it. We're going to take off our fire. Yes, look at that. Yes. The temperature inside there now is pretty hot and that intense heat will force the bread to oh, rise a little more. It really is amazing to me that, I mean, you know, the, the Romans had, had this colossal understanding about the intricacies of, 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 of bread. When you look at those ovens that survive in Pompeii, they are very, very um, industrial in their quality. Right. The bread is left to bake for around 20 minutes. OK. God, that looks amazing. That's a good... It's a good colour. And listen, listen to that crust. Oh, I love a crust. Uh, yes, you can't good. have bread without a crust. It's going to break your teeth, crust. I'm getting a deep sense of the fresco from this. That's good, thank you. Are we going to break the bread? Let's break it and let's see what happens. OK, let's see what we've got. Mmm. Wow. The texture is... I am very, very pleased with that texture. Mm. How would Romans have eaten the bread? Because they didn't eat it on their own, did they? Of course not, no. There's always an accompaniment, a relish. Um, and depending on the social status, it could have been something very elaborate. Um, or something simple. Uh, and we've got cheese and olives and some fruit, some dried fruit. This is a typical lunch, I suppose, for an Italian. It looks great. It's, it smells really earthly. Very typical. Nutty. Come on, I'm dying to oh, try it. Okay. So we're going to have a little bit of butter, because I think butter actually makes all the difference. You can't beat a bit of butter. All right, we've allowed ourselves a little modern luxury. This really tastes and feels like a modern sourdough to me. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm genuinely amazed that the Romans are making almost exactly the same bread as we're making today. Bread is life. For the Romans, bread baking became part of their social structure. It was also a simple daily necessity. But fast forward to the 20th century, and bread gets a dramatically different artistic treatment. There is one artist who's taken the depiction of bread to a whole different level, the king of surrealism, Salvador Dali. Bread appears repeatedly in both Dali's artistic output and his outrageous publicity stunt. I've come to Figueres in Spain's Catalonian region, Dali's birthplace, to find out why a simple food was such a fascination for this complex artist. When most people think of Dali, they think of lobster telephones and surreal eggheads. In his 1945 work, Basket of Bread, you can see the extent to which Dali studied and borrowed from the canons of art history. 
the first thing I notice when I come into this room is what a pivotal role this bread painting plays in the room. If I didn't know that this was a Dali, I would have said it was an old master. There was a Vermeer. You know, apparently, him and Gala, his partner, always traveled with this picture. This is how significant this picture was in his life. There is a sort of, to me, like an altar effect. I mean, you know, it's a, to me, it seems quite Catholic in its execution. You know, I mean, this is just me, and it's a Catholic thing. I'm so, I feel beyond the bread, beyond that light, there's nothing. Only five years before painting Basket of Bread, Dali had publicly reclaimed his Catholic faith. For me, it just adds to the sort of mystique that is Dali because, I mean, the, the versatility of the man, the beauty of this painting, the intensity of it, the bread personally to me looks alive. I mean, the closer you get to it, the, the detail, it looks, it looks like it's about to pop out at you. It's a masterpiece. Dali's bread obsession even drove him to decorate the exterior of the museum he built in Figueres with rolls and loaves. Monsi Aguirre, director for the Centre of Dalinian Studies, tells me more. He lived here for four years and he decided to decorate all with this bread, special Catalan bread and especially from this area. What was his relationship with bread? You know, why is it represented everywhere? Yeah. This, uh, this bread reminds him a little bit the Toreador's hats. Right. He used bread also to design surrealist objects. Right. Tell me about the shape of the bread, because this is not something you see everywhere, is it? No, no. It's a spe special shape. It's like a horn of rhino. Uh, Dali said that. that uh, this is related to a horn of rhino. Right. Bread is constantly... And it's an obsession. He was a very obsessive person, right. and bread was one of his main obsessions. He said, first of all, I wanted to be a cook. Yeah. Then I changed, I wanted to be Napoleon. Whilst the bread on the walls of his home in Figueres was pretty radical, Dali's artistic exploration in Paris in the early 70s went even further. Here, Dali collaborated with fellow bread obsessor, the late artisan baker, Lionel Poilin. The company, now run by Poilin's daughter, Apollonia, exports the four pound loaves around the world, producing an average of 15 tonnes of the stuff every day. Hi, Apollonia, I'm Oliver Payton, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. I'm very excited to be here. Dali commissioned some extraordinary bread creations from Poilin. Here's some of the photographs that we're taking at the time. Here's a, a picture of, um, of my father, right. my grandfather, with the, the cabinet. Um, let me show you. Great. Salvador Dali, my father, the cabinet, made out of dough. Yeah. Dali's amazing commissions were conceived downstairs in the bakery. So we're, we're arriving at a, at, a, at a very good time because you're replacing the chandelier upstairs, right? But exactly. Um, you're right. Perfect timing to, uh, to see the making of the new chandelier yeah. for our little um, back shop. And this chandelier was originally uh, designed for Salvador Dali. Right. My father and Salvador Dali met circa 1969. Right. And they started developing this relationship whereby Salvador Dali would call my father I think every Tuesday morning around 11, uh -huh. he would start asking my father to make very simple things made out of bread. A frame, for instance. Right. And then very quickly, things escalated in size until the day in 1971, where Salvador Dali calls up and asks for a whole bedroom made wow. out of bread. Wow. Quite a challenge, right? Yeah. <laughs> Vincent, who's here, um, is, uh, was one of the bakers who worked with my father wow. to make the bed, the night table, the chandelier, the closet, everything made out of bread so that Salvador's room in, uh, in the Hotel Maurice uh, was designed out of bread. Amazing. And, and, and the relationship, how did that develop? Because, you know, I, you know, I've seen your father as, as an artist in his own right. I mean, he's probably the most famous bread maker that we know of. And, uh, and Dali as well. They were both 
big characters, no? I think it's, it's a collaborative work. Um, right. You know, on, on the one hand, my father had this passion for his, for his job, baking, and a passion for a product, bread. Right. And he, he didn't just see bread as a physical food, but, you know, um, almost a spiritual food in the sense that it's, it's so linked with history, with uh, uh, economics, politics, sure. and arts, Absolutely. obviously. And has, has Vincent here, has he always, is he the one who's always actually produced them? Vincent has been the person in charge of the, of the chandelier since, since he worked with my father and Salvador Dali in the early 70s on the original bedroom made out of bread. Wow. The different pieces of the chandelier have been baked and now they're assembling it. Right. And they're going to bring it upstairs to, for, the, for the final uh, accrochage, yes. as they say in French. And how long does it normally take to complete, from start to finish? It's just a finish? piece of construction. It's it is a really, it's a piece of construction. It comes in different pieces, and it t usually takes several days. Standing here, just watching this whole process, you know, and the fact that you've got generations of bread makers who have always worked for Poilin, and, and it's lovely to see that tradition being maintained. Mm. You know. And I think it's also, it's symptomatic of our, of our whole uh, process at Poilin. Uh, for instance, when we bake a loaf of bread, um, so we mix the four basic ingredients, yeah. water, flour, salt, yeah. and a piece of dough from the previous batch, yeah. the sourdough. So maybe there is an infin infinitesimal part of the 1932 right. first batch of, of bread baked by my grandfather in that loaf. So as um, Vincent is passing on uh, the tradition to Pascal, um, the sourdough is transmitted from one generation of bread to the next. Right, fantastic. And there it is. There it is. Wow, it's amazing. The chandelier made by uh, my father for Salvador Dali in 1971. Right. This isn't actually Dali's original 1970 chandelier. As bread disintegrates over time, the bakery have to replace it every two or three years. Dali's bedroom, made out of bread, was finished in 1971. Reputedly, he did it to find out if he had mice in the house. How do you feel now when you see that photograph? I am extremely proud um, to, to know that my father worked for Dali. Right. And um, I'm extremely proud to carry on this heritage uh, of, of their uh, collaborative work uh, with the chandelier. Fantastic. Well, that was a fascinating experience for me because those people are artists and it just shows you how in France, bakers, patissiers, chefs are revered in society. The French were great bakers, but in the 17th century, it was the Dutch who created some of the most popular breads, like pretzels and scones. Berkheider's The Baker was painted in 1681. Berkheider portrayed himself as the noble working baker, blowing a cow horn to advertise the morning's freshly baked bread. Artists were moving away from painting bread in purely religious terms to show real stories of everyday life. Berkeheide the Baker is a really fascinating painting because it's a sort of photographic reference of the time and the level of detail in here is fascinating. There are loads of different types of bread. I can count about seven. But it's also the bigger detail, the fact that his stole is outside his place of work. He's got a horn blowing to attract business. What I'm getting from this painting is the fact that this guy is toiling away and he's making bread much as we make it today. I mean, this painting is 400 years old. The fact is, you can still buy bread like this in very good baker shops. We make bread that looks like this. And I think that's amazing. I think it's amazing that paintings like this were being painted at the time. I think it's amazing the bakers were baking like this at the time. In North London, Dan Leopard is an award-winning baker who has worked alongside great chefs, including Alistair Little and Giorgio Locatelli. He studied Berkheider's painting, searching for minute clues on the canvas to see how he can recreate the bread taste of the 17th century. It's a fascinating painting because bakers, generally people go into baking because they can't read and they can't write. So we don't have 
that many records from that time that tell us what bakers did, except for paintings. Yeah. And paintings like this explain exactly what, what bakers did. And from looking at the, the breads themselves, you can see by the little burnt bits or just by the white strip around the outside of some of them, how they were cooked, the temperature of the oven. I, I can tell so much about it. That's amazing. <laughs> good, good, good. I mean, if we take the, the first large bread here, I would say in comparison with the other breads, it was probably made with a little bit of white flour, a little bit of rye flour. Yeah. You can also tell that it was baked for a long time because it's, it's really quite, quite dark on top, but also dark in all the crevices inside. And you can only get this by baking the bread for a long time in the oven. From what I understand, white bread was seen as something that rich people ate and, and darker grains were for the working classes. And why have we seen mixed grains here? Generally, that, that was true, but certainly by the, the end of the 1600s, uh, white flour was, was beginning to, to be eaten, say, by the, by the middle classes, where, whereas um, prior to that, uh, the white flour was really such a rare thing. I see pretzels here. The pretzels that are hanging at the back, and you can see dotted around the front. These pretzels are clearly baked in a, a cooler oven because there's just a soft golden hue to them but they were left in the oven until the, the crusts were firm. Uh, if they were taken out too early, they would have sagged a bit. And these aren't sagged. These are very well-shaped and beautiful pretzels. I think in some places you find, for example, that people go and have their bread baked in a central oven. People tended to use the, the baker's oven as as their oven because many people didn't have ovens at home so they would they would take their roasts take their pies take take their the, the food that their cook had, had produced to to a local bakery to be cooked but not bread generally people went to the baker to buy their bread and one of the reasons is there was a fairly complicated relationship between the miller and the baker and generally the flour went from the miller to the baker and then people people bought it that way so it was almost like a little cartel of sorts right there yeah. So how are you going to interpret this for us? What are you going to do? What I'm going to do today is make the breads using old techniques. So what I had to do to do this was, was take beer, boil it off to get rid of all the alcohol, mm. then stir a little bit of a sourdough starter into it. Now this is a mixture of, of a very coarse whole wheat flour and then very pale rye flour. This would have made something very similar to the, the flour that would be used in the bigger loaves. And then I'm just going to stir all this together. Now finally, a small amount of salt will be added. Yippee! Yes. So this is going to sit for how long? This bread will sit for, for six hours or seven hours. What I'm going to do now is take this dough out and plonk it onto the table. And I'm shaping this dough into a ball. Now, one thing Burkheider's um, baker appears to have done is when they've put it into the basket, they've left it quite rough on the top because we can see these, these points that yes. are coming up. So that's what we're going to do. Our large loaf is set aside to proof before going into the oven. Now Dan starts to replicate the 17th century pretzels sold on the baker's stall. So what we've got here is, is a very simple dough that the bakers would have used to make the pretzels, probably the soft rolls as well. What I'm trying to do is get these about three feet long and somewhere between half an inch to an inch thick. What I've got here is a, a big pot of boiling water. And what I'm going to do is just drop these, these pretzels in. By dipping the dough in hot water, what you do is make it really shiny, make it look good. It adds a sort of Tiffany-esque gloss to the outside. Right. Um, and I think bakers did it because it helped them sell. They're terribly delicate at this point. I was just see. going to like say. They're like jelly. Give it a poke. Wow. Yeah. When we make these today, people tend to want salt on top of them, and I love having salt on top. But I'm not sure that this would have would have happened at the time of the, the painting. So, so it's a little bit of my own artistic license here. I love salt and bread. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they look gorgeous. 
Yeah. Really gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, they do not look like pretzels as we uh, we know them today, do they? Yeah. No, no, and I, th I think that, that we've, we've really lost something. You've got that slight sweetness from, from the, the crumb and then that mm. blast of, of salt against the roof, roof of your mouth, too. Mm. You know what? Mm. Mm. There is a sweetness to it. Mm. I actually think the salt contrasts extremely well with it yeah. because mm. underneath there is, is mm. quite a mm. sweet mm. bread. Mm. Mm. And now, the pièce de résistance, the sourdough which Dan has already put in the oven, is finally ready. That's a piece of art in its own right. It is, it is. Uh, probably a, a rather rough-hewn sort of piece of art. It's really quite beautiful. I love all these markings on the top, these, where, where it's torn and, and uh, coloured. I am so excited now. I've got to tell you, just watching you doing this, you know, all this time. I almost think in the painting there's a sense of excitement, like the baker's ready too, like I'm ready, because so much work has gone into this that when you, I mean, taste this. Taste that. Listen to the crackle of the oh. crust. The... This is the sound I love, that crackle is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know when people are tasting wine and they, they talk about there's honey and there's... There's oat and there's grass. You can smell those. But you know what? This is a, I mean, there's something about this flavour. You know, you're getting a yeast. I'm getting yeah, a yeast. Yeah. Also, a beautiful, beautiful sour tang. Mm. After you've chewed it for a moment, you can, you can taste that. It feels to me like earth. Mm. It feels to me mm. of the land. Mm, I'm mm, feeling, mm, mm. you know, I'm, I can, I can taste the mix. I can, you know, yeah. it's absolutely one of the best breads I've ever tasted. <laughs> Thank it really you. is. Thank you. Fantastic. had a real sense of how and why these artists responded on canvas to a food that many of us take for granted. But what surprised me is that through art, I have discovered how little proper baking has changed over the centuries. I'm Oliver Payton. This is Eating Art. The series takes food from the artist's palate to the plate. As a restaurateur and art collector, in this series, I'm combining my two great passions. My fascination for food. That is beyond fantastic. And my addiction to art. The beauty of this painting, the intensity of it, it's a masterpiece. For centuries, only paintings gave us a taste of what and how we used to eat. Everybody is off their heads here. So in this series, I'm traveling across Europe and North America on a journey to discover the history and the stories behind food on canvas. It's just amazing. Very amazing. It must have been the punk of his time. Visiting the homes of the world's most prolific food artists and discovering how food was eaten at the time. There was a far more intense flavour than I was expecting. Good to see you. Plus, I'll be dropping in on the world's most acclaimed chefs who bring these great gastronomic artworks to life. This is an artist at work creating their own masterpiece on a plate. Fruit is about colours, it's about shapes, textures. It pushes artists' techniques, but it also tells a story, the story of trade and discovery and the story of life and death. Painting fruit isn't just about still life. Artists often use fruit in larger pictures, giving them huge significance. One painter who pushed the boundaries of art and who courted controversy with just the humble apple was the 16th century hellraiser Caravaggio. To appreciate his extraordinary talent, you have to see his work in the flesh. I'm in London's National Gallery with fellow Caravaggio fan and art historian Andrew Graham Dixon. This has got some of the greatest paintings in the world in it, this room, but you're always just drawn. Yeah, you really are. You can see why Martin Scorsese loves Caravaggio, because yeah. there's all the drama of his movies in that painting kind of prepared in advance. But it's the depiction of the fruit for me. I mean, the realism in the fruit, the sort of warts and all. It's astonishing, that still life. I mean, it's 
Before still life painting has really got going in Italy, Caravaggio is about the first painter to really concentrate on fruit and vegetables. And he does it <laughs> better than anyone has ever done it before and will ever do it again. You know, the apples are absolutely you know, fantastic. I don't know anybody who gets that. You know, that sort of the dullness of the reflection that you get in the apple compared to the luminescence of the reflection that you get in the grape, compared to the, to the subtle sort of way in which the pomegranate seeds seem almost to absorb the light.